Hi, my name is Dr. Tamra Ranasinghe. Uh, I'm one of the vascular neurologists at Wake Forest Baptist Health. And today I'll be going through uh, stroke care. Just a quick overview of what we do here at Wake Forest Baptist Health. I have no relevant disclosures. So the outline for my today's talk would be, I'll first describe what exactly is a stroke and what is a TIA, a transient ischemic attack. And then I'll go through uh, the prevalence and statistics when it comes to strokes. And most importantly, I'll talk about how do we really identify stroke symptoms and then what stroke treatment is available uh, for patients who present with stroke. So just a quick history about, uh, about stroke is, uh, it was first described by Hippocrates, uh, Hippocrates in uh, 400 BC, which is uh, at that time, he did not really know what stroke was, it was termed as apoplexy. So what it means in Greek is struck by, by, by violence because he was seeing patients falling on the ground with weakness on one side or the other, unable to talk. But at that point, they did not really realize that there's something going on in the brain. Later on in the 1600, Jacob Webber is the one who um, did autopsies on these patients who had apoplexy uh, and discovered either some of these patients were having clots in their brain or they were bleeding in the brain. So that's how at that point they discovered, okay, apoplexy is because of something going on in the brain. And later on in 1689, the word stroke was coined. So uh, when we talk about stroke, we have to remember there are two types of strokes. One is ischemic type of stroke. And what does that mean? Basically there is a clot that forms in one of the blood vessels and prevents blood flow going further down. So therefore the blood tissue beyond that point tend to die. So that is what we call an ischemic type of stroke. The second type of stroke is what we call a hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke is because there is, a, there is bleeding, rupture of a blood vessel in the brain can cause bleeding in the brain. Uh, and most commonly what we see is hemorrhagic, or sorry, ischemic type of strokes, which is about 85% of patients. Uh, therefore, for the sake of the talk today, I'll be only talking about ischemic strokes. Okay, so what is a TIA? This is very important when we talk about ischemic type of strokes. Basically, TIA is a warning before someone has a future stroke. It, it occurs when there is a blockage of blood supply to the brain, and it lasts only for a short time, and we have to remember that it does not really leave any permanent brain damage. TIAs also will present similar to strokes, um, but does not leave uh, temp, uh, does not leave long lasting damage. But at the initial setting, we cannot differentiate between stroke and TIA. So both are medical emergencies. So that's why we have to really keep that in mind. And we don't really in the acute setting when a patient comes to the hospital, we might not be able to differentiate. The only way we can say the patient had a TIA is when the, the scans are done, there is no damage. We don't see on MRI brain scan, we don't see a stroke. And the second thing is the symptoms should resolve within 24 hours. Those would be what we call transient ischemic attacks. All right, so let's talk about stroke statistics. And why do we say stroke is very important? Because every 40 seconds, someone is having a, a stroke and every four minutes, someone's dying because of a stroke. So that shows the, this is a, has a large burden affecting our community. So every year about 795,000 patients end up having strokes. And out of that about 600,000 are having the first stroke for the first time. So that leaves about one in four patients once they have a stroke, they have a higher probability of having further strokes down the down uh, for the rest of their life. All right, so let's talk about how does it affect us financially. So in 2000, between 2014 to 2015, the US government spent $46 billion for stroke care. Stroke is the leading cause of serious long-term disability. And stroke also changes by race and ethnicity. Um, there is a higher risk if you are a black patient compared to a white patient, there's twice the higher risk of death due to stroke. Overall, death due to stroke over the last decade has decreased, but unfortunately in Hispanic patients, we've seen a higher uptake of death related to stroke. 
All right, so how about age? We know as we all get older, there is an increasing risk of stroke with age, but younger patients also can have strokes. In 2009, 34% of patients hospitalized with a stroke was less than 65 years old. All right, so this is a, a map we love to use. This was uh, the stroke death rates by county uh, in the whole of US. And what we see here in purple is the highest death rate because of a stroke per, by county. So if you look at the Southeast over here, there are eight states, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, uh, Alabama, Georgia, and the two Carolinas has the highest number of deaths per county. And this is called the stroke belt. And if we further look into that and see the highest number of uh, darker purple rates are in what we call the stroke buckle. Unfortunately, we fall into that, the two Carolinas and Georgia in the stroke buckle. So that tells us we are in an area there's high prevalence of acute ischemic strokes. All right, so um, now getting into North Carolina and stroke stats. So stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in North Carolina. Every 20 minutes, someone in North Carolina is hospitalized because of a stroke, and every two hours, someone is dying because of a stroke. In 2017, there were 5,100 deaths uh, because of strokes in North Carolina, and 2018, there were 31,693 patients who were hospitalized because of a stroke. Then when we look at financially, we spent over $402 million for 54,526 beneficiaries who had a stroke in just one year in 2018. All right, now let's, we looked at the whole country, we looked at North Carolina, now let's look at Wake Forest per se. How many stroke patients do we really see? We look at 2021. Uh, if you look at ischemic strokes, these are the, the because of a uh, blockage, we, we, in 2021, we saw 607 patients. There was a downtrend mainly because of COVID affecting patients and not really coming to the hospital, but usually we see anywhere from 600 to 700 patients of acute ischemic strokes. Then um, about 240 were bleeding type of strokes and 312 were either small strokes or TIAs or transient ischemic attacks that we saw in uh, 2021. So let's get into the most important thing, stroke symptoms. It is, it is very important to really identify these symptoms. So any combination of the following symptoms, it could be a stroke or a TIA. Remember, these are medical emergencies. Acute onset of uh, numbness or weakness in the face, arm, or leg, especially on one side of the body, then sudden onset of trouble speaking. It may be just unable to bring words out or just unable to understand. Sudden onset of vi visual defects or unable to see, maybe one eye, maybe both eyes. Sudden onset of balance, unable to walk properly, dizziness or coordination issues. These are all signs of the patient could be possibly having a stroke. It is very important to call 911 if it's happening to you, or if you see someone else with these kind of symptoms, please call 9111. It is, uh, or data tells us about 89% of North Carolinians can know what to do when they see a stroke. They know how to call 911 when they see a stroke, but only 19% were able to really identify the actual symptoms of stroke. So that's again, very important why I'm talking so much about how, why is it necessary to identify these strokes. So we've come up, or sorry, stroke symptoms per se. We've come up with a mnemonic called BFAST, which stands for B stands for balance, I stands for eyes, F stands for face, A stands for arm, S stands for speech. If, if you or anyone that you is ex, uh, experiencing any difficulties with any of these modalities, T for time, call 911. It is very important. Now you may ask, why is it important to call 911 and how does it really change? So data tells us every minute that someone's having an ischemic stroke with blood flow not going to that brain tissue, the patient or you, the person who's having the stroke is losing 2 million neurons per minute. 
So therefore, it's a medical emergency. We should try our best to try open that clot out. And also, if 911 is called and once the patient is being brought by EMS to the hospital, rather than someone driving into the hospital or someone being brought to the hospital, what EMS can do is they notify the hospital, the emergency department, I'm bringing a stroke patient. So that pre-notification helps to alert or activate, or activate a stroke code where the stroke docs are in the ED waiting for the patient to come to the ED. And meanwhile, uh, the EMS can draw blood out and put in IV lines to make sure the patient is ready if needs to, if the patient meets criteria for any acute therapy. And also, as soon as the patient comes in, the stroke team is there in the ED, sees the patient and take, can take him, direct, him or her directly to the CT scan. So once a patient comes, we have two modalities of uh, therapy that we can give for acute stroke patients. One is through IV medication through the arm, which is IV TPA, commonly known as the clot busting medication. The second is modality is mechanical thrombectomy, or go, the, our neurosurgeons can go through the groin, go to the brain and uh, bring that clot out. So to, to have the capability to, to have both these modalities, it needs to be a comprehensive stroke center, such as uh, Atrium with Torres Baptist Health, as we are, we are recognized by the Joint Commission and the American Heart and Stroke Association. Uh, there are two comprehensive stroke centers in Winston-Salem. One is Wake Forest, the other one is Nuant. So let's talk more about this clot busting medication, which is called IBTPA, which stands for Tissue Plasminogen Activator. It is a FDA approved medication. In 1996, it was approved and we can give this medication up to three hours from the time when the symptoms started. And later on in 2009, the time was expanded up to four and a half hours. Per the guidelines in 2013, we try to give this medication. DTN stands for door two needle, meaning once from the time the patient comes to the emergency department to the time the patient gets the, 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 uh, the medication, it should be less than 60 minutes. But as a comprehensive stroke center, we try to do this less than 30 minutes. So that's our goal. We also have to keep in mind, though this is a very good medication and it helps with stroke recovery, there's always a risk of bleeding. There is about 6.4% chance of someone having a head bleed because of this medication. And out of that, about 3%, 45%, which is about 3% out of that 6.4 can be fatal. So though it is a very good medication, it carries some risks of bleeding. All right, so what are the contraindications? There are some for patients, unfortunately, that we cannot give this medication. One, one of the most important things is if the patient was, the symptoms started beyond four and a half hours ago, then we should not give this medication because it is not approved, one. Second, because it can cause bad bleeding in the brain. So if the patient was, symptoms started beyond four and a half hours, we do not give the medication or we cannot give the medication. If the blood pressure is really high and we cannot control with medications, again, another reason we cannot, which we can't give the medication. If a patient is hypoglycemic or has low blood sugar, then we have to rule out it is not the blood, low blood sugar causing these symptoms. Then we first initially give some dextrose to see if the symptoms improve, then we can consider giving the medication. The other contraindications uh, if we already see some bleeding in the brain or if you're suspecting bleeding in the brain, then we cannot give a blood thinner. Uh, if the patient has had a recent stroke, which in the last three months, if the patient's had recent brain surgery or spine surgery, we cannot consider this medication. And that is all within the last three months. If it's more than three months ago, we can consider giving the medication. If the patient has had prior head bleeds or any malignancy or any masses in the brain, again, we cannot give the medication. If the patient is actively bleeding or has a history of uh, bleeding disorders, then we cannot or we have to be careful before we give the medication. If the patient is on any of the uh, newer blood thinning medications, things like Eliquis, Pradaxa, Xarelto, uh, again, we cannot give this blood thinning medication. And the last one is if the patient, we already see a large stroke on the M uh, CT scan, again, we avoid giving the medication. So how do we give this medication? The first 10% or the bolus is given over one minute and the rest of the 90% uh, 90 of the medication is hung on infusion, uh, which goes over 60 minutes. 
And after someone gets this medication, they are taken usually into the ICU. We, are, we closely monitor um, with every one hour. We do a neuro exam. Uh, we make sure the blood pressure is under control and we try to avoid any other blood thinning medication unless in special cases because the patient is already has got a strong blood thinning medication. Apart from IVTPA, which is also known as alteplase, there is an older drug, but now which has come back into use called tenecteplase, which is also uh, in our stroke guidelines, which can be used instead of alteplase. So how many of these TPAs or how, uh, clot busting medications do we give? Uh, if you look at 2021, what is in uh, blue, we gave 58. Usually we gave anywhere from maybe around close to 60 to 70 patients that we give TPA. And what's in orange are patients that we see in other hospitals. So as stroke docs, we cover uh, 21 other smaller, uh, or firstly our sister hospitals and smaller other EDs and other hospitals where um, neurologists are not available. And we see these patients via camera. Uh, and then if we, we look at the scans, look at the patient, and if we think these are patients who are having a, acute ischemic stroke, then we uh, recommend the clot busting medication. And what's in orange are some of those hospitals cannot keep these patients, they send them over to us. So we take care of uh, the TPA patients that were given in a different hospital as well. So overall, for about a, in a year, we take care of close to 150 patients who receive TPA. When we go to this map, <clears throat> this is kind of uh, a map showing uh, what are the other telestroke hospitals that we cover. This is our mothership here at Atrium Bay Forest Baptist Health, and we cover 21 hospitals across the state. Um, then we move on to the second modality. So I spoke about IVTPA, which is a clot busting medication. The second thing that we can do if the patient is having a large clot and is within the first 24 hours, we can do what we call mechanical thrombectomy. The neurosurgeons go in and take the clot out. Again, these two modalities are not mutually ex exclusive. Some patients only get TPA. Some patients only get mechanical thrombectomy because if they are beyond that four and a half hours, some patients can get both therapies. So this is a scan that I put in just for sake of, for us to understand. Um, this is a CTA scan, CT angiogram, showing that there is a blood clot sitting. If you can see on the left side, this is the left side of the brain, uh, fills over here, but on the right side, there's a clot sitting here, it's not filling. So there's a clot sitting here on the right side of the brain, which is uh, one of the vessels called the right middle cerebellar artery. Uh, apart from getting the angiogram, the vessel scans, we also do a perfusion scan uh, to see how much of brain is already damaged and how much can we really save. So if you look at this scan, this shows what's in green is the area of brain which is at risk. So basically, if we really don't do anything or if we can't pull that clot out at that point or dissolve that clot, th there is a chance that 114 ml of, of brain tissue can get infarcted. At that point, already five ml of brain is already infarcted. What is in purple is irreversible tissue, which we cannot really unfortunately do anything. So this patient came in, we, this is the same patient who had the previous clot that you saw on that right side, and was, this is also on the right side of the brain, uh, and was taken in for thrombectomy, and that when they go for thrombectomy, they do what we call a cerebral angiogram, a different type of a scan looking at the clot. So this is the blood vessel going into the brain. If you can see, there's an abrupt cutoff here. This is on the right side. Uh, and then um, the clot was taken out. This is a clot. And then how it opened and the blood flow uh, continues to go to the brain, supplying the right side of the brain. And um, later on, before discharge, we did an MRI scan to see the extent of the stroke because MRI scan gives us uh, more we, or we can visualize the, the real stroke burden on MRI scan and we see what is in uh, the, the bright area here is uh, where the patient had a stroke. Uh, when we compare, if we had, if you were unable to do anything or if this patient did not get therapy on time, the patient may have had a whole stroke corresponding to this whole gr green area. So this patient overall had a good outcome. So how many of these procedures uh, do we do for a year? So usually we do anywhere in the 115s to the 120 range. So in 2021, uh, we've done 121 of these procedures. Again, all my data, unfortunately, is only up to January of 2022. So for the last five months, I have, sorry, for the last four months, it's still not been updated. 
All right, so let's get to uh, the stroke risk factors. Uh, there are modifiable stroke risk factors and non-modifiable stroke risk factors. The modifiable stroke risk factors are hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol. These are three very important modifiable risk factors. That's why you need to follow up with your primary care physician more often than not, because they are really good at making sure these risk factors are taken care of. Uh, heart disease, atrial fibrillation, <clears throat> physical inactivity and obesity, uh, bad diet, these all can contribute. And then also other habits like tobacco smoking, illicit substance abuse, including marijuana, uh, alcohol use disorder, all of these can cause increasing risk of stroke. Then the non-modifiable risk factors, unfortunately, these are risk factors we cannot really do anything much about. Age as we get older, high risk of stroke, uh, family history of stroke, uh, sex, race, and prior stroke or TIAs are also non-modifiable risk factors. So now, so initially I spoke about the acute care, the two modalities of giving IV TPA and doing thrombectomy. Now let's talk about secondary stroke prevention. After someone has a stroke, uh, if either if they got acute therapy or not, how do we, what can we do to prevent someone from having another stroke? Because if you do recall my, um, uh, one of my uh, prior slides, Remember, one out of four patients end up having more strokes after the first stroke. So one of the most important risk factors that we can really uh, change and prevent strokes from happening is controlling high blood pressure. The target is the top number, which is what we call systolic blood pressure. We should try and keep it less than 140. Ideally, if possible, less than 130, 130. That would be the ideal number. There are several medications that can be used. Uh, ACE uh, medications and thiazides are the medications that have been extensively studied for lowering stroke risk, but that does not mean the other medications are not good. All blood pressure medications are good. The end result should be making sure the target blood pressure is achieved, which is less than 130, ideally less than 130, if possible, less than 140. Uh, for patients who have a history of high blood pressure, it is recommended, and if possible, if the blood pressure is not very well controlled, self-monitoring at, uh, at home, getting, having a blood pressure cuff, and it is important you take the blood pressure cuff uh, to your primary care physician to calibrate it, making sure that the, the blood pressure is, uh, the cuff is working well and the, 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 the machine is working well, and also checking the blood pressure at a specific time uh, of a day, for example, if you're going to check for a, uh, for a month, you know, every day, if you want to check, you check maybe at eight o'clock and 12 o'clock or every day at 12 o'clock. So doing it at the exact time for a day is ideal. And most important medication adherence in, not only in hypertension, in all secondary stroke prevention, it is very important. Uh, next, we get into antiplatelet therapy. These are patients who, uh, who, which we tend to put them on antiplatelet therapy are patients who don't have or who are not having a cardioembolic reason for a stroke. So what are cardioembolic reasons are if, if the patient has atrial fibrillation or a clot in the heart, then uh, it is not antiplatelet medications that we recommend. We recommend anticoagulation, which are stronger blood thinners. So the antiplatelet medications are aspirin, uh, Plavix, which is also uh, clopidogrel, which is 75 milligrams, or Brillinta, which is also no, known as Ticagrelor, which is 90 milligrams, but that's twice a day dosing. So patients can be in, taking any of these medications. Um, sometimes there are some subset of patients, we try to put them on two of these antiplatelet medications, either aspirin and Plavix or aspirin and Brillinta. Uh, we usually do these, give these medications for either 21 days or 90 days. Very rarely should a patient continue uh, two antiplatelet medications lifelong unless there is uh, a, a real necessary. We usually do not recommend because someone being on dual antiplatelets for lifelong, it could put them at risk of bleeding. So there may be very rare cases that we may have to do it, but usually it is temporary that patients are on two antiplatelet medications. And when starting antiplatelet medication after ischemic stroke, we tend to start it as soon as possible, unless if the patient has got 
uh, IVTPA, the clot busting medication, then we have to wait for 24 hours because if you start antiplatelet medication or any type of blood thinning medication, it can increase the risk of bleeding. Then we move on to atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is basically irregular heart rhythm, which can lead to causing clots in the heart and then it can go to the brain causing uh, strokes. So let's look at a case. Let's look at an 80 year old female with a history of hypertension uh, and diabetes who came in with a stroke, ischemic stroke, and while in the hospital was found to have atrial fibrillation. All right. So at that point, what we do is we try to stratify the risk we use a score called the Chad Stuvats VAS score and give points for the risk factors. So patient is eight years old. So the patient gets two points, has diabetes, one more point. So three, came in with a stroke, five points, has, uh, is a female, uh, six points, and uh, there is one one, sorry, hypertension is going to be give seven points. So someone who has a risk of uh, the score of seven, if we do not, start a blood thinning medication, anticoagulation medication, there is a 9.6% chance of this patient having a stroke every year. So that's very important to remember. And that's why we tend to look for atrial fibrillation number one. And then once we find it, we try to treat it. So how do we treat it? There are stronger blood thinners to antiplatelets. They are called anticoagulation. The newer ones are called the direct oral anticoagulants. These are Epixaban, which is also known as Eliquis, Davigatran, which is also known as Prodaxa, uh, Rivaroxaban, which is also known as Zerelto. So these are the medications that we can give for some subset of patients who cannot either tolerate these medications or they have uh, uh, mechanical heart valves or if they do have uh, atrial fibrillation because of valvular disease, then they need to be on a medication, the old medication called warfarin or coumadine. Usually the INR should be, which is uh, INR kind of tells us if the blood is thin enough or thick enough, or if it's, you know, we try to main it, maintain it between uh, two and three. Usually there are some patients that need to be at a higher level. So how do we really diagnose atrial fibrillation? So it can be diagnosed by doing a usual EKG, which can be done with at the primary care physician's office, or when the patients come to the emergency department. And once someone has had a stroke, we put them on telemetry monitoring with, with our, if you look over here, these are small stickers that we put on the patient's chest and it is monitored uh, at bedside if the patient has atrial fibrillation. And usually during the whole hospital stay, the patients are monitored on uh, telemetry. And if we still can't figure out if the patient did have atrial fibrillation or not, then some patients, we tend to send them home on external devices. Some of these devices are, you can, uh, you can carry it in your pocket for, this is usually done for 48 hours. Sometimes we send them on a, at least in our institute called something called a Zio or a Zio patch, which is a sticker that we place uh, over the chest, which monitors the heart rhythm for 14 days. Apart from that, if the patient still, we say 14 days have gone, we've not found atrial fibrillation and we've not really found out uh, the cause for the stroke. Uh, another way to look for atrial fibrillation is um, we can use a device called implantable loop recorder. It is this device over here. It is the size of a size of a pinky or smaller than the size of your pinky. It is less than two inches. Um, just for you to have an idea, I've taken a photograph of what it looks next to a thumb drive or a pen. And how we can do is we, you know, we get our cardiologist on board. It is a small skin incision uh, uh, is made on the chest and this is slipped under your chest. And this device will monitor your heart rhythm for three years. So it gives a lot more data than the other devices which are done for a short term. And once this device is implanted, usually people after two or three days tend to even forget that they even have a device. So un unfortunately we have really, we don't have really robust guidelines to say what device to use and for how long to use. Usually all stroke patients need to have monitoring of the heart at least for 24 hours. Um, if not beyond that, it is up to the physician to decide what type of modality that they can use. So the next risk factor is high cholesterol, which we call hyperlipidemia. What we try to do is, or the, the bad cholesterol is called LDL, uh, which stands for low density lipoprotein. The, the, the level should be, the goal should be less than 70, 70 after a stroke or a TIA. Uh, 
if someone has not had a stroke, it is optimal to keep it less than 100 or 130, usually less than 100. But once someone has had a stroke, we recommend the patient's LDL, the bad cholesterol, should be less than 70. And how do we bring that down apart from diet and exercise is starting a patient on a statin medication. There are uh, high intensity statins and low intensity statins. High intensity statins are a TOA statin, which is Lipitor, either 40 or 80 milligrams, or Rosua statin, which is Cresto, which is 20 or 40 milligrams. Patients who are older, we can even start initially with a moderate in intensity statin. All right, so once medical management is done, or if you think these are not patients that medically we can manage, there are a few surgical options depending on what the patient is having. So if the patient does have uh, uh, stenosis, narrowing of one of the blood vessels that's taking blood to the brain, especially in the anterior circulation, these are the carotid arteries, it's more than 70% and the stroke is on the same side, either uh, we can do what we call a CEA, which stands for carotid endarterectomy, or a stenting. And this is done by our neurosurgeons or our vascular surgeons. Basically, a carotid endarterectomy is a surgical incision is made on the neck and goes into the carotid artery and takes the plaque out manually and then stitch the vessel back up. Uh, carotid stenting is basically they go through the groin and into the vessel and uh, th they don't take any plaque out, but put a stent and uh, that widens uh, the narrowed area in the blood vessel. Then another surgical procedure that we can do with the help of our cardiologist is, is if it's a younger patient who comes in with a stroke and there is a connection between the right and the left side of the heart, then we can do uh, what we call a PFO closure. PFO is a patent foramen ovale. Sometimes we tend to refer it as a hole in the heart, but actually it is not a, a true meaning of a hole in the heart. It is more of a connection between the right side and the left side of the heart. All of us, when we are in our mom's uterus, we do have uh, this connection. That's how the blood flows, uh, because we are not breathing at that point, that's how the blood flows from the right to the left. And all of us, when we are, or not all of us, when we are born, uh, when we are born to the world, uh, as soon as we cry, usually this connection, the flap, flap here closes off. One out of four people, it keeps open. So that connection sometimes can cause clots in the leg to come through to the heart and cut across and go to the brain. So um, everyone who has a PFO or, or a patent for an oval does not need to that get that close. These are younger patients, and if there's no other risk factors, then we consider closing uh, the PFO. Uh, that can be done with the help of our cardiologists. Uh, so the last uh, surgical method I like to talk today is uh, uh, what we call left atrial appendage closure. So this is the left atrium that is a chamber in the heart. Patients who do have atrial fibrillation, which we spoke a short while ago, and if they cannot be on the blood thinning medication because of increasing risk of bleeding or increasing risk of falls, what we can do with the help of the cardiologist is close this area in the heart, which is the left atrial appendage, where clots can really form. So um, this is a device that you can, uh, the cardiologist will put into the heart and it'll take the nidus away where the clots, clot formation happens. Um, and now let's move on to um, lifestyle modifications. So this is, though this is not spoken too much about, but this is something that all of us can actively engage at home and make sure we make uh, right decisions. So if someone's smoking, smoking cessation is very, very important. Abstinence from recreational drugs, alcohol use. If someone, especially a patient who's had a stroke or a TIA is males drinking more than two alcoholic two or more alcoholic uh, drinks or uh, females, if it's more than one drink for a day, uh, counseling is recommended by the American Heart and Stroke Association. Uh, then when it comes to a healthy diet, it is recommended for patients, so if possible, follow a Mediterranean type of diet, which includes more of monosaturated fats and plant-based plant fats uh, and fish con consumption. And using things like uh, virgin oil and um, uh, nut and tree oil, that kind of stuff. Uh, if the patient has had a stroke and has high blood pressure, 
when we recommend to reduce the sodium intake. Usual sodium intake per day is about 2.3 to 2.5 grams of salt for a day. But someone who has had a stroke and we want the blood pressure to come down, it is reasonable or it is recommended to bring that down by one uh, gram per day, which comes to about one gram or just 1.3 grams uh, of salt per day. Um, so I put this on just to have an idea of what do we really mean by a Mediterranean diet, what do you mean by a DASH diet. So basically limiting saturated fats, both diets recommend if, you know, limiting that and if needs to be using high monosaturated uh, uh, fats, uh, using things like, again, olive oil, uh, using more of or taking more of plant-based food, including fruits, vegetables, uh, and both the diets emphasizes on um, whole grains, increasing fish consumption in the Mediterranean diet compared to uh, what we call red meat. Poultry is considered okay compared to a more of fatty meat or red meat. Uh, low consumption of overall meat products and especially processed meat for products. Low to moderate red wine consumption, uh, moderate consumption of milk and dairy products. And this is common to both discouraging uh, soda drinks, pastries, sweets, or kind of baked products. So we have to try and avoid fatty, sweet food. Then we move on to uh, physical activity and weight loss. What can we do? Because this is important and as well. Moderate intensity aerobic exercises, what is recommended is minimum. This is for stroke or TIA patients, okay? Minimum of 10 minutes for at least four times a week. If it's vigorous, you can, you know, we can, what is recommended is vigorous aerobic exercises, which is 20 minutes twice a week. This is again the minimum what is recommended for stroke or TIA patients. If a patient is more sedentary, sitting, uh, in doing a job which is sit, more of sitting is involved, it is recommended every, you know, every 30 minutes standing up for about three minutes or doing some light exercise for about three minutes. All right, so rehab and recovery is very important because as I stood, as I uh, alluded before, uh, most of our patients uh, end up disabled. Uh, and then though the stroke rate or the death rate because of stroke has dropped over the past years, two thirds of our patients end up going to what some type of rehab center, maybe uh, acute rehab, maybe SNF, maybe hospice, some, some type of uh, rehab centers that they end up going to. And sorry, the last slide, this is important. I put this picture because stroke is not only uh, one person's job. It is a team effort. The physicians, the nurses, the coordinators, the uh, therapists, speech, uh, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, outpatient nurses, you know, these are, it's a, it's a, the whole team effort to, and the patient and family is also important to prevent strokes from happening in the, in the future. Uh, so this is just for information because most of us tend to ask or some patients tend to ask, Doc, I'm going to, uh, I'm told to go to the acute rehab center. How long do you think I'll be there? Unfortunately, we really can't. It depends on uh, the stroke size and uh, what deficits the patient has. But data tells us usually patients that end up going to the acute rehab center stays for about two weeks. And most patients after stroke when they are being discharged to a rehab center, most of them, 32% goes to a skilled nursing home. All right, so to conclude, uh, to take home points for my talk today is remember there are two types of stroke, ischemic strokes, which is because of a clot. The second is a hemorrhagic, which is a bleeding type of stroke. The only way we can say the difference is by getting a non-contrast head CT. If we see blood, then we think it is a a bleeding type of stroke. If not, then it is an ischemic type of stroke. Remember, stroke is common and a leading cause of disability and death. Time is brain. Remember, guys, right? For the last one hour, it's not been one hour, but over the last one, one, one hour, 90 patients had had a stroke and 15 have died because of a stroke. So let those numbers just sink in to show how important this disease is and how we can as a community to take care of one another is by identifying, knowing, knowing the stroke symptoms, identifying and calling 911. Remember the mantra, time is brain, identify symptoms, 
and call 911. Thank you. If you do have any questions, uh, there are, you guys can reach us um, by contacting the Wake Forest, Atrium Wake Forest Baptist Health uh, online website.